So we're going to show, let's say one, two, we're going to show, we're going to go through three Bible verses that teach, that we extract the doctrine of the papacy from. One good thing I wanted to add to about that before we read the passage, one important thing to know is the thing that we look for is not the word in the Bible. Like we're not looking for the word Pope. Certain words um, evolve. Yeah, they, they come over time. Different titles, honorary titles of de designation, different things come in time. And some, some things do legitimately develop that way. A good example of that is the word Trinity. Okay, everyone that professes to follow Christ believes in the Trinity. Never mentioned once in the Bible, the word. You know, we first start hearing that word like late, uh, late second century. So that gives you an idea, right, of things. But what we're looking for is the teaching to be found. That's the important part. So, okay, we're all in Matthew 16. All right, so we're going to start at verse uh, 13, and we're going to read it down to verse 19. So 13 to 19, so do we have any volunteers? Goddaughter? Okay. Wait, what are, what is it? Verses 13 to 19. 59, right? Matthew 16. Yeah. Okay. What did you say, 13 to 19? Yeah, 13 to 19. Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, for Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Uh, is it Hades? Yeah, it can be either Hades or some translations say hell. So, yeah. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay. okay. So, Let's talk about the imagery of what's going on here, the context of it. So Jesus takes them, right, just to Caesarea Philippi, which if you've ever been or if you ever go, is a massive, massive piece of rock. Okay, it's huge. Um, and that rock used to be a pagan temple where they would do child sacrifice in it, okay, at the time of our Lord. But he brings them to this image so that as he's talking to them, you can see this massive rock behind him. It's also said, we know this now as a fact by historians, that they used to think, people back then in that day, that, that this rock in Caesarea Philippi, in the middle of it, contained a portal that sent you to hell. Right? You remember that? They used to have a, a lake that ran through it, and they thought the middle of this lake sent your, sent your body and soul to the pit of hell. Okay, so this is what's happening behind our Lord as he's talking to the apostles. It's a very specific image he's giving them, okay? And from there, he asks his apostles... Who do people say that I am? Because by this point, he's not been around for some time doing miracles, doing teachings to multitudes, right? Thousands and thousands, multiplying the fish and the loaf, raising people from the dead. So now he's talking to his apostles in a very specific private way saying, hey, you've all, you've been talking to people. Who do they all say that I am? What, what, what is the word out there about me? Right? That's, what, that's what he's asking. And notice how it, they respond with, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say you're one of the prophets. So in other words, there's all these different views of who Jesus is, right? Different different ideas out there. Some prophetic guy or some, almost like, like, a, like a reincarnated John the Baptist. Like, you know, oh, that, that's who you are kind of a thing. It's interesting because one thing it shows is that this is what the world gives us is confusion. Especially when it comes to teaching or identifying the one true God, it's all confusion. It's all speculation, all opinion. Well, we think this, we think this, we think this. Right, that, that's what you see. You see that in the world today. You see it back then. So then our Lord goes on to say, okay, but who do you say that I am? So now he's talking to them specifically, right? Who do you specifically say that I am? And no one answers other than Simon Peter. Okay, Simon's the one who answers this passage. And Simon gets up and says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, identifying who Jesus actually is out loud, right? And what does Jesus say? He says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to, has not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
So what Jesus is saying right there is when he says flesh and blood hasn't told you this information. He said you didn't learn this from anybody. Right? It wasn't like Peter went around investigating and said, well, you know, based on my research, I think that's who this is. And flesh and blood also means it's not like Peter just thought about it of his own logic. Peter wasn't just sitting there thinking, all right, if I really put two and two together, it has to be that this is the solution. Peter, in a sense, is just as confused as anybody else's. But that's why our Lord says, my Father who's in heaven revealed this information specifically to you. He revealed it. And that gives Jesus a signal that yeah, God the Father in heaven is telling him this is the one to lead the church. That's how Jesus knows. Because he asked this question, no one seems to know, there's all this confusion, but Simon stands up and says, this is who you are, the Son of God, the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, my Father has told you this. So think about that. The Father in heaven came to the assistance of Simon to tell him this is who my Son is. This is the true teaching, the true doctrine of who he is. So that's, a, that's an insight to our Lord right Jesus then goes on in verse 17 or I'm sorry uh, in verse 18 so now he's talking to Peter directly Simon at this point his, his birth name is Simon Simon Barjona I mean Simon son of Jonah okay and our Lord says in verse 18 this is the key passage he says I say to thee that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church the gates of hell will not prevail against it so there's a few things to break down just in that verse. This is like really, this is the key verse that the church used to make their dogma when it came to the papacy. This was the primary passage in Matthew 16, verse 18. Okay, what Jesus says is, first he calls him Simon, but now he says, you were Simon. Now he says, you are Peter. Thou art Peter. He's changing his name. And from here on out, he will always be known as Peter. Okay, that's always going to be his name moving forward. Now, why is that significant? Because name changes, whenever they happen in the Bible, are always significant from God. They always have a meaning. Names in the Hebrew language were very rich with meaning. Very rich. Um, you know, you see it even like in Native American cultures. Like, they have names that signify, you know, running deer or soaring hawk. You know, they, they're significant names <coughs> for a reason. In the English, we've kind of, it, that idea is lost on the modern culture. We, we go with names that we think sound nice. Like, you know, Roman is a nice name. Or, you know, we think of what name sounds good. Roman Catholic. Yeah, <laughs> Roman Catholic. The key, th the key thing, though, is that we often don't stop to pray about this name will signify something unique about this person. It's like, this is how the ancient Hebrews looked well, at I names. I did it because of strength. I yeah. looked up what Roman meant. And he's strong, isn't he? Mm -hmm. So there you go. Um, so in the Old Testament, for example, in Genesis... You guys familiar with Abraham in the Old Testament? Yeah, it was Abram. Yeah, well, famous. Uh, you know the, found, the they call him the father of faith for ancient Israel, Abraham. And in the Old Testament, his original name is Abram. No, no, a, a ham. It's just Abram. That's his birth name. Abram means father in Hebrew. It just means father. Abraham means father of nations, father of multitudes. And when Abraham shows faith in the one true God, God tells him, you're no longer Abram, you will now be Abraham. And he even tells Abraham in Genesis 22, he says, look to the stars of the sky. These will be your descendants. Your descendants will outnumber the stars of the sky. That's in Genesis 22. So what God is saying is you were called father, but now until the day you die, you're going to be called father of multitudes, father of nations. There's another famous case in Genesis between a man named Joseph and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jacob, Jacob and, Israel. Jacob and Israel, Jacob, whose birth name means one who is conniving, one who's deceiving, which that was his lifestyle early in life. He then has a mystical experience with God where it says he actually wrestles God and God changes his name to Israel, which means God prevailed because God prevailed over him in the fight and he surrendered himself to God and God changed his name. So whenever you see a name change in the Bible, it has a lot of significance. Simon, who's being talked about here, Simon means almost like um, a reed that shifts with the wind. It's, it's shakable. That's what Simon means. It's a, it's a reed. The word Peter means rock, firm rock, okay, almost like boulder. And so Jesus is saying, prior to this, you've been this, but now moving forward, thou art Peter. Thou art the rock. And again, imagine the imagery as he's saying this behind them is this massive amount of rock right behind them. It's almost like Jesus is visually showing him this is now who you are. 
This is like the strength of your faith at this point. So that's a very key thing. He doesn't change the other apostles' names. The other apostles don't even have a, a, a response to who Jesus is. The Father selects Peter alone, and Jesus, upon seeing that, switches his name to Rock. Now, is, the, is the Rock like um, the same thing as my first pope? Uh, what do you mean? Say that again. Is the Rock like equivalent to like you're going to be the first pope? Yeah, this is what we're showing. Oh, what we're okay. attempting to show now yeah. is that the Church uses this verse to teach. This is where Je- this is where Jesus institutes the papacy. The, the papacy. Okay. Yeah. And so first he changes Simon's name to Rock, which in English is Peter. Okay. And he goes on to say, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Okay. The word Peter, the name Peter, in Greek is where we get the word, it's the word Petros. That's the Greek term for Peter, Petros. And the feminine word for church is, or the word for church is Petros. It's a feminine word, Petros. Okay. Okay. Jesus has to give him a masculine rendering because he's not a female. So he calls it Petros, rock. That's what he's saying. You are Petros, and upon this Petra, which is the, upon this rock, I will build my church. Okay? It's very important to understand because what Protestants often will argue, is the ones that are more in the know of their studies, they'll say, well, you realize Petros means tiny pebble. Jesus, what Jesus is saying there is you are a tiny pebble, but upon this rock, meaning like on myself as the Lord, you know, I'll build my church. So the Protestants try to twist it this way. The key, there's two key things to this, though. Is number one, the whole idea of Petros meaning tiny pebble was something that by that time was done away with by at least three centuries. By that time frame, Petros and, and Petros were interchangeable words. They just meant rock. That's what it meant. The other thing is, if Jesus wanted to say tiny pebble in Greek, he would have used the word minera. You are minera, but upon this petros. Minera does mean tiny pebble. Minera. Minera. But all Jesus says is you are petros, which at this time in the Cohen Greek of the first century means rock. And upon this rock, petros, which is a female term, I will build my church. Okay. Um, a deeper thing about that, so you guys know, and tell me if you know this already, you might already know this, but a deeper thing is Jesus didn't speak Greek, which we often forget. The New Testament, by and large, is written in Greek. He didn't speak Greek. Who knows what language Jesus spoke? Aramaic. Yeah, Aramaic. And that's what you see in the Passion movie by Mel Gibson. It's all in the, Ara- the Aramaic language. In Aramaic, there's no distinction between Petros and Petros. There's no feminine and masculine. Huh? There's no feminine word for rock. There's none. One. Exactly, it's just one, it's Kepha. Thou art Kepha, and upon this Kepha I will build my church. Mm-hmm. So our Lord links the two together. Peter and Rock links the two together, one and the same. I mean, we see uh, the gender changes, right? Like in, in Spanish they do that, right? I mean, I don't know Spanish well, but you know, I hear like, mi, huh? It is. Yeah, like mijo and mija, yeah. right? Mi, boy and girl. It's I know also in the French language they do this, right? But in so Greek does that too, Petros and Petros. In Aramaic, there's no distinction, just Kepha and Kepha. That's very important again because Protestants try to separate the name Peter from the word church. You see that where it says, you are Peter and upon this this rock I will build my church. They're trying to separate Peter from the word rock. That's what I meant to say. They're trying to separate those two terms. Peter is one thing, but rock is something else. It's like in their interpretation, they would say, you are Peter, but upon this rock, I'll build my church. So it's almost like G- what they look at is as if Jesus is saying, like, you know, Johnny, you're a rock. However, I'm going to build my church over here. Or you're a rock, but I'm going to do this over here. That's how they try to interpret it. What they're trying to say is, well, yeah, Jesus tells Peter that he's a rock. But he's not building his church upon him. You know, he's building it upon himself or upon Peter's faith, you know, upon the faith of all believers. They're trying to make it as if, the church is not built upon St. Peter as the head. That's the key argument going on right here. But he had to do that because he knew that he was going to be sent. The crucifixion was going to come up, so he had to leave it to somebody. Yeah, he had to have a governance in place. Because imagine if we elected, let's say, George Washington as the first president. George Washington dies, and we're like, well, back to anarchy. No one knows what to do. Yeah. No successor, no anything. This is what they what they try to argue. Yeah, the apostles were, you know, yeah. some kind of authority. They died. Boop, that's it. Or Jesus rose from the dead. Now what? Figure it out now. Yeah, we got to reinvent the wheel, right? So the verse says, "You are Peter, and upon 
this rock. The Protestants want to say, you are Peter, but on this rock, or however, on this rock. They want to separate the two. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, you are Peter, and upon this rock. Now, even making it more specific, when it says upon this rock, in the Greek, it's epi, taute, ta petra, which literally in English means, you are Peter, and upon this very rock, I will build my church. Or you could say, upon this same rock, I will build my church. So Jesus can't make it any more clear. You are Peter, and upon this rock. He's saying, you are rock, and upon this rock I will. So he's building this church on St. Peter. Why? Because of his confession of faith. Because the Father told Jesus, this is the one. So he's now going to build the church on Peter, with Peter as the head. He says, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The very powers of hell cannot overcome this church. What church are you talking about? The one that he's right now building upon St. Peter. You see, does that connection make sense? Mm -hmm. This is the an important passage here because this again is showing us that Peter is being made the rock of the church. Jesus is designating him like you're going to be the head of the twelve. That's the important part here. And so that's why Protestants attack it so much. The fact that it says the gates of hell can't prevail against it is our Lord's way of saying to Peter and to the apostles and to us, there's going to be no amount of false teaching or our secular armies or whoever that can ever prevail this church. This church will stand until the very end of time. We've had people in history, I don't know if you've heard of the, the, the Napoleon quote, where Napoleon in the French Revolution wanted to overthrow the Catholic Church, and he told a bishop, he said, we're, we're going to overcome your church one day. And the bishop laughed and said, if we haven't overcome it by now, there's no way you're going to do it. You know, but see, governments have tried to come to war against the Catholic Church. Heretics, like the Protestants, and you mentioned the Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses, mm -hmm. the Mormons, um, all throughout history, her heresies try to over to come out and say, no, the, the true faith is this, we teach this. They're trying to discredit what our Lord taught. But Jesus is saying, now this church built upon Peter, the gates of hell will never overcome it. Which, again, gives us the confidence as to why we listen when the Pope authoritatively teaches and that's the key word, authoritatively, when he authoritative teaches. Not when the Pope is talking to a, a, a reporter on, on an airplane and giving his opinion on something. And who am I to judge about, you know, gay people? Like, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about, the, like, official doctrine of, you know, laying down dogmas for the church. We can have certainty this is true, right? Now, how can we have the certainty? This is where the final verse is, verse 19. Jesus tells Peter... I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now here's something interesting too to throw in. Up until this point, all these verses we've read, they're all in the Greek singular. Which means when Jesus says, I will give to you, whatever you bind, you are Peter. Whatever you, whatever you, blessed are you, Simon. They're all directly related specifically to Peter. I say that, and again, it's important because Protestants will say, he's talking to all of us. You see, he, he, when he says you, he means all of us. We're all the object. Of, no, he's talking to Peter specifically. You, you, you. These are all Greek singulars. He's not even talking to the other apostles. But look what he says in verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys in ancient Israel, and in, in that culture, specifically refer to authority. Being able to create censures, excommunicate people, uh, teach doctrine, give governance. These were authoritative. Even today, what do keys symbolize? Right? If if I give Stephen the keys to my house. Access. Access. It gives him access. Here's keys and here's keys to my car. Stephen has authority now to open my car, open my house, lock up my house mm -hmm. to protect it from intruders. Mm -hmm. That's what we, stores are the same. That's what keys symbolize. Jesus is telling Peter... <laughs> The kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, I'm giving you the keys to that very kingdom. And whatever you bind will be bound in heaven. When it says whatever you bind, what he's telling Peter is whatever doctrines you set down for the church, that is bound in heaven itself. Now, what do we know about who's in heaven? Who, who reigns in heaven? God Almighty. God Almighty. What's the one thing we know for a fact about God that scripture tells us of what God cannot do? Does anyone know? Hold on. Yeah. Go against his own nature. Go against his own nature. Okay, that's the philosophical answer. Mm -hmm. Can't go against himself, right? Yeah. But more specifically, then, so what? Because of that, what can God not do in heaven? 
Okay, I'm confused by what you were saying, the context of what you were saying. Give communion. <laughs> no, I'm, I was confused by the context you were saying it. Say it again, sorry. Yeah, like, in other words, he's Almighty God, mm -hmm. but there's a certain specific thing that God is not capable of doing. Because, as she, as Carolyn said, you can't go against your own nature. He can't deceive himself. So what is the one thing that God cannot do? Mm. You know? But cannot or will not? Cannot okay. ever. Mm. It's impossible for him to do. Uh, unbind what has been bound on earth? Like, Somewhat. Is that what it is? I mean, that's what it's coming to. But the okay. answer is God cannot lie. Yeah. That Because of what you oh, said. okay, okay. Because God is pure truth. Mm -hmm. So God cannot lie about anything. He's pure truth. He can't deceive. Mm -hmm. He can't tell a half-truth. Mm -hmm. he's, pe he's pure truth. So he's incapable of lying. Ooh, I just got choked, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's incapable of lying. That is crazy. And because of that, what the uh, Bible scholars tell us from that passage, wow. Titus 1 ver two, verse 2 is what says God cannot lie. It means he cannot bind a lie, cannot condone a lie, cannot sanction a lie. Cannot hint at a lie, nothing. He's pure truth. We deceive all the time. God, can, he's incapable. You know, he's incapable of it. Um, so now look what Jesus says to Peter. Whatever you bind is bound in heaven. And if God cannot lie, then what that means, whatever Peter binds has to be true. It has to be. And that right there is where we get the dogma of papal infallibility. That meaning that when the Pope lays down a dogma, a teaching on faith or morals that he says is binding for the universal church until the end of time. That's where we get the assumption of Mary, perpetual virginity, the Eucharist, we get the, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, baptism, all of our dogmas, purgatory, all of our core beliefs. What we're to believe. What we're to believe to be faithful I Christians. Think that's the confusion, though, too, because you get a lot of Protestants or, or people who are not Catholic that say, oh, the Pope said this in an interview. Oh, he said it, yeah. so it must be okay now. Yeah. And it's their own interpretation. And it's like, no, that's not what a binding teaching. is. Yeah. Yeah. Binding I teaching. That's a huge way. misconception. on authoritative teaching on the faith and morals. Yeah. You have to got to remind them because they're all human still. They can yeah. still give their own opinion. They still exactly. lie. The Pope's still alive. Yeah, you, know? you, you could go to Rome and ask Francis for directions to downtown Rome, and he may give you wrong directions. Exactly. He's not infallible <laughs> yeah. himself. It's not infallible teaching. Yeah. He was, that's, you, you make up a good point, because they like to bring up, oh, oh yeah, the Pope's infallible, because it says so in the Bible, right? Yeah, they and think he's infallible on everything, corner. you know, and, and that's it not the way it, it works. It's hard to defend a lot of what he says and does. <laughs> It makes it very difficult. It's very important now we know, like, when the Pope's chilling on an airplane, some news reporter comes up, Francis, Francis, weigh in on what's going on over here. Weigh in on your thoughts on this teaching. You can say whatever he wants. It's just his personal thought. Mm -hmm. An infallible teaching is very specific. You know when it happens. One, the church will be buzzing about it across the world. He's going to make a dogma, and you'll know. But the Pope has to make it very clear that he's speaking as successor of Peter in his role as the head of the universal church, a teaching on faith and morals that he's binding to the universal church. That's how you know. And when that happens, what does Jesus say? The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And we know now from what scripture shows us, it can't be a lie. It can't be a lie. And that's the other key thing like you guys are talking about is we need to know the, the difference between being infallible versus being impeccable. Impeccable means, you know, you're not, you, you can't sin. You're just perfect. You're flawless. And the church absolutely teaches no, no pope is impeccable. No, no, no pope is the Blessed Virgin Mary. She's sinless. Popes are sinful people. You will, at some point in your ongoing studies in the church, you will come across stories, I'm, I'm giving you a heads up now, of crazy, crazy immoral yeah, stories from the medieval times and all over. Dark ages. Dark, you'll hear lots of crazy things. Really sad. Which only reinforces the belief, the reality that, yes, we got to pray, especially for our leaders, for their, their repentance. Hierarchy. You have the hierarchy, their their salvation to go to heaven. They're sinners just like us, wow. you know. So they can misguide us. They, they, they well, they can misguide in their own personal life. Yeah, number actually. one, and yeah. their actions. There are folks who've had affairs, fathered children, killed other <laughs> people. You see all sorts of crazy things in history at times, right? You also have very holy saints, very exemplary, like saintly, you know, holy fathers. So you see the whole mix, right? Um, but that, they could. In a way, misguide you. They could, but that's why. Uh, it causes scandal. Like well, it causes scandal, but that's why it's really important to know the Bible and know yep. the faith. Mm -hmm. To know, to know the authoritative is. teachings yeah. of the exactly. faith. To know yeah. the, the dogmas and the teachings of Christ, because 
it's not that you're going against the authoritative uh, state of the Pope, but you're going against what his opinion is. Yeah. You know, and and that's what's important. Yeah. You know, especially today. Very, very spot on. Very much so. Yeah. So popes can misguide in their personal opinions on things, even on theology matters. We've had cases of popes who said wrong things. They weren't talking infallibly. They're talking to groups of people, and it's happened throughout history. Um, there was a famous case of a pope uh, named John the Twenty Second, who, from the pulpit, talking to a group of seminarians over the course of several weeks, was teaching that when you die, if you're in a state of grace, you don't see the Trinity in heaven. You don't see God in heaven when you die. It only happens after Jesus returns, right? The bishops were telling him, his own bishops, like, Holy Father, you're wrong. The church has always taught authoritatively that when you die in a state of grace, after you've made any reparation in purgatory or whatever, that you go straight to the, the vision of God before the second coming. You can see God already when you die. And the Holy Father persisted in it for several weeks. It was actually a false teaching. It was like a heretical teaching. And he was getting, so you're talking about a manifest false teaching that he's getting corrected on that some years later he finally repented of. And came, he was like, hey, I was wrong on what I taught you guys. You see, he corrected himself. The point is, he's just talking to some seminarians. He's, again, not an infallible binding teaching for the universal church. You know, that's the sad part of the world we live in today with the news is like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we all have access to it like this. Yeah. If today that happened and we, like right now, a new uh, notification came in. Uh, the Pope tells seminarians in Rome that when you die, you can't see the Trinity. And we're like, oh, did you see what the Pope said? Oh, my gosh, this is scandalous, you know. That's the hard thing about it, because back then, you might have heard that story a year or two after the fact. He might have already repented by then, you know. But popes can do that. But that's why, like we all said, the important thing is stick to the authoritative teachings. You can never go wrong. Pope can say things that are scandalous, like what's happening today, and we say, well, pray for him, you know. So... That's what that's the best we can do. But you'll never be led astray by the authoritative teachings of the church. But I think that's why as a laity we have a huge responsibility to to keep like I guess the higher ups like in check also because throughout church history you see so many saints that have come up and said like spoken out against them, like no. you're wrong. This isn't what we believe. Like no. this isn't what church teaching. You know? Yeah. True. Um, we have but, an obligation, but they have yeah. the uh, they have the highest responsibility when yeah. they die because they got an answer for all that. Yeah. yeah. For all that scandal. Very we, true. We really don't. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because we don't have that position that they have, but yeah. yeah. But we do have an obligation to call out. Uh, call false, out error. Call yeah. out error when we see it. And the thing about the popes that is interesting is, they they're not in there for four years, or or um, ten years. Like a term. And yeah. Left out. They're oh, there really? till they die. Oh, yeah, yeah till death. So they, yeah. That, uh -huh, so they have that responsibility of being there no matter what. Now Pope Benedict is not there. He was like the only Medical one that did issues. that. Yeah, yeah. But most nine times out of ten, mm -hmm. they're always there till they die. So there's that responsibility that they have, you know. So, and and God's not going to put random people there. Mm -hmm. There's reasons why people are in a certain. He's not going to allow somebody to be in a, a certain position that's not supposed to be there. Yeah. You know, it's so, so interesting you say that because mm -hmm. I think for some reason with this current pope, I don't know what it is. Something about him is just like I don't know. Like I want them, like I, you know, I think well, it's, isn't yeah. there like a fallen? And there's a reason why he's there. Or something like people that? could say, yeah. well, he he shouldn't have been elected or he shouldn't have been chosen. Well, it's not us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's literally it was God's will for him to be there. He's not going to have somebody lead his church that he doesn't want to. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's our prayers that we have to as a laity as you know as catholics have to come together and kind of just pray and put it also in our bishops and whoever is higher up in their hands as well because they're the pope's right hand man they're yeah. supposed to be there that's why like all the infiltration or whatever's going on it messes us up yeah. because they have a lot of say of what goes on in there and sometimes yeah. god will send chastisements mm -hmm. you know, he will and uh i mean that's again what our lady of fatima we t you know she talked about and um you know francis is difficult he's a challenge but all the more so we need to pray for him. All the more so. You know, like our one senior always says, imagine if he had full repentance and just came out full, you know, steam ahead for the, the truth of the Catholic Church. And you know, imagine what that would do to the world. Yeah. The witness martyred. would be. He might be. Might be a <laughs> yeah. martyr. He'd be martyred. But we pray for him, you know. I think so, for sure. So, and you can't yeah. stop what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. We don't know till the end of time. We don't know what's going on. We don't mm -hmm. know when Jesus is going to come back. 
so there's a certain things that are in place for a certain reason and we kind of just have to put it in God's hand that's just like um, when Jesus was about to get crucified people mm -hmm. were trying to stop it from happening and the apostles were there trying to fight the, the, the soldiers uh, the soldiers and he's like please don't do that like this is supposed to happen don't stop it yeah so it sucks that it's happening in our church because this is like what we what we believe and then it's like we get mocked for something that other people are doing from mm -hmm. our higher ups mm -hmm. but that's a, just a humility thing that we have to kind of sit there even like with all our priests and what what school is going on with them mm -hmm. i heard it all the time from family members saying stuff you know well and so and, and i think that it all starts within the family you know like mm -hmm. within each individual family you have one two three and then four families right here at this table coming together as one family mm -hmm. and then when you go home you have to and i think that's how he also builds his church is within the family first yeah and then you teach each other and and then you go from there you can see how how much you know families are connected and how we're all intertwined and we make up the church yeah. mm -hmm. and it's so important to stay true because i have there's six of us brothers and brother and sisters and we all grew up in the catholic faith and we all grew up you know the same well to this day thanks to you know john carol ann and then johnny you know that I, I stayed true to the to the church but now you have protestants in my family and you have uh -huh. you know more lukewarm secular people. secular i mean i we get it all the time from people mm -hmm. criticizing us when we're doing things within the church and you know why you guys have to go every sunday and like were well, you going to confession again you just went last week and it, it's horrible where i have a sister that goes to a bar every weekend and she doesn't get talked at all you know <laughs> she's like you know yay you know you're having so much fun you know and and then here it's like why is elise you know so it, it, and even like to carol ann not you know like if you weren't invited to people that party in the family you know, and I always told Carol Ann, just be the, be the, be the one that just stays true. You don't want to be there, you know, let them do whatever, pray for them, and then just keep strong. But, um, you Which know, she's very I'm, good at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's I, a I strong one. That, just stay strong. Yeah. Don't worry about that, you know, you're where you need to be. And, um, but within the family, I think that's very, very, very important. Well, a good witness to that too is, I mean, not to put you guys on a pedestal, but what you guys are doing now taking your faith seriously, having your mm -hmm. kids homeschooled. Wow. It was a huge step, a huge leap to do, you know. That's school. amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a huge witness, job. it's powerful. Yeah, good <laughs> oh, good job. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, just I'm saying, like the, being very involved at your church and all those mm -hmm. things, which is very good. And, um, you know, you guys go to what, like marriage retreats for spiritual warfare, mm -hmm. conferences, stuff, I mean, it's a good witness, you know, for other couples. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, yeah. So, I mean, okay, going back to this. Do we all understand the importance of Matthew 16? Yes. Do we, yes. It makes oh, sense. Yeah. Peter's the rock. Yeah. He's the rock. The church is built on him. Gates fell, can't prevail. No and whatever he binds is bound. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it almost reminds me of the Maui, like the church, the Catholic church. Oh, yeah. It was, it was it alone standing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, yeah. No, yeah. what is it? That line, that line was like... Oh, no. Yeah. And I didn't know too. It was a Latin mass. Yeah. It was a Latin mass. Yeah. How cool is that? The only thing standing was a Catholic church. It burned everything around it. Oh, that one building was a Catholic church. It's a Latin church. That's amazing. Okay, so. What's the one? The Pope wants to take down the Latin mass. It's not that he wants to take it down. A whole it's a whole topic. <laughs> yeah, it is. We'll just stay on this topic. Yeah, I mean, we could discuss it, but it'll get us way off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know you guys talk about it, but she ignores us. Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it after. Yeah. <laughs> While well, I eat pizza. Yeah. Reading. The second passage we're going to look at, this one's a little bit smaller, but it's so we're at John chapter 21. So three books after Matthew. You're going to have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And 21 is the very last chapter of the book. Oh, there's Doritos. Why didn't I see that? I didn't see it the whole time. What is it, 21? I'll take one. 21, it's verses 15 to 17. Thank you. What is it, 21? 21, Doritos are so good. I don't have any tapatios. Tapatio? Tapatio. 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 
All right. Well, we'll volunteer read it, and then I'll give you the, the quick context of it. But who wants to read? Love? Go, Love. Um, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Okay. Now, here's the quick context. This is happening right after Jesus rose from the dead. So by this point, Jesus already suffered, died, was buried, and he rose again the third day. Peter has not really addressed Jesus specifically ever since he denied him three times. So remember when Jesus was arrested... He said, before the cock crows, you'll deny me. And, and Peter does. Three times. I don't even know the man. I don't know the man. The leader of the church, unfortunately. Showing you what we just talked yeah, about. He's human. He's human. Here you have the rock of the church. And what is he doing? Denying Jesus. He's not even at the cross. The first pope in history. He's not even there for the most important event in Christian history. Because <laughs> he's hiding. So what happens now? Jesus rises from the dead. And he comes to the apostles. And he knows it's time to talk to Peter. You know when you have that one-on-one -on -one coming up. That just has to happen even though you're avoiding it. <laughs> but it has, to, it has to get out. It has to be dealt with. This is what's happening here. Is Jesus coming to Peter, and Peter basically is like, I don't know, I want to avoid this, but it's like, nope, it's game time. you got to deal with it. Comes up to him. Now, in that context, what's happening here is Jesus asks Peter, you notice the same question three times. You know, uh, Simon said to Jonah, do you love me more than these? Meaning more than the other apostles. Do you love me more than anybody? And three different times, Peter, what does he say? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, what the church fathers and the saints tell us, this is a threefold confession and repentance from Peter. Why? Because he denied him three times. Oh. Three times. Yeah. See, you notice by the third time, Peter gets exasperated. Like, yes, Lord, you know it. You, everything, you know that it's, it's hard for him. He, in other words, he just wants things to be okay again because he knows what he did was wrong. He knows he, what he did was wrong. But Jesus has to get out three times. You, you denied me three times. You need to profess your love to me three times. Shows you the beauty of penance and justice within the church. Yeah. You know, we always use the knowledge, like, if you broke the window, you got to fix the window. You know? So this is what's going on here. So three times he says, do you love me? Yes, Lord, know that I love you. The key thing is what Jesus says after each of these three professions of love. Huh? Tend to my sheep. Yeah. So what's the first one in verse 15? But How does yours read it? Be my lambs. Feed my lambs. Okay. Here's what's interesting is that, in, yeah, in that passage, okay, the word feed in Greek is boske. And that word means to spiritually, not literally feed them, like here's some food. It's spiritually enrich them and feed them and protect them. Right? Feed, nourish, protect, take care of my lambs. And even in the ancient translation, um, yeah, it's, it's the word lambs. And what, so what's being referenced there by lambs are the bishops of the church. Think about this really quick. The bishop, Why the bishops? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God. They have authority over... Yes, exactly. They have authority over people. The bishops do. They, have, they possess the authority because they're successors of the apostles, or they are the apostles directly, right? So bishops have a spiritual authority in this regard and they are meant to act in the person of jesus you see that so repeat that real quick i'm sorry well okay so jesus is the lamb of god okay bishops are referenced as the lambs of the church why because they act in the person of jesus mm. that's why so what is he telling peter when it comes to the other apostles and bishops he's telling peter solely again by himself i need you to spiritually nourish the rest of those in authority oh, okay. to tend to their needs to take care of them to protect them so he has an authority over the other authorities there's something unique with peter in that regard okay so then what does it say in verse 16 what is how does yours say it tend my sheep tend my sheep notice now not lambs right now it's sheep who are the sheep uh, we are we are because Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd, 
and my sheep know me and hear my voice. We are the sheep of Jesus. He's our good shepherd. So first, what does Jesus say? First, he's saying, Peter, spiritually nourish and feed and protect those in authority. Then Peter says a second time, yes, Lord, I love you. And the second time, Jesus says, okay, great. Now that you said a second time, now what I need you to do is feed my universal church. Take care of my universal church. Not just the authority, all of us. Mm -hmm. So Peter's invested in every single one of us now. Mm -hmm. And the word there for, for the word feed in the Greek is poimene. This is a very, very key word because in Greek, how does it say it in your translation in verse 16? The feed? Yeah, is it feed or tend? No, it's tend. Tend, it's okay. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, sheep. Yeah. and tend my sheep. Okay. No, the first tend my sheep, tend my sheep, and then feed my sheep. Okay. Wait. So it's the lambs first. Yeah. And then it's tend my, my sheep. Tend my sheep in verse 16. Sheep. Yeah. That word tend in verse 16 means poimene. And poimene literally is where we get the word not just tend or some they would say shepherd. It's the where we get the word even in legal terminology for rule and govern. Like take charge? Take charge. Yeah. Rule. Like tend to, you have to rule over them. So you have to govern them. Governance. You know, you have to take the, take the lead when it comes to these people. And notice how, again, the word rules put in there. It gives the connotation of someone in authority like a king. You're to rule the subjects. You're to rule the citizens. It's an authoritative term. That's the important part. So what Jesus is saying, spiritually nourish those in authority. Then he says, rule over the rest of the church, universal. So who's the ruler in that context? The Pope. Because the Pope succeeds Peter. You see what I mean? That's the important part of what's going on here. So it, Protestants will say this passage is only showing us that Peter messed up, so he's just saying he's sorry three times. That's all it says, nothing more. But they're missing what the Greek says about this. It's much, much more. Mm -hmm. It's not just you messed up, but I forgive you. It's like now that I've forgiven you, I'm restoring you back to who you need to be because mm -hmm. he's now he's going to ascend to the Father. And now that I ascend, he says you need to be the one to start ruling and governing and taking care. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the final one, verse 17. And how's it say it in yours? Tent, or feed my sheep. Feed, feed my, my sheep. sheep. Mm -hmm. So what do you say in verse 15? He said, feed my lambs, right? Mm -hmm. Spiritually nourish those in authority. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 17, now it's spiritually nourish the universal church. Mm -hmm. So in three verses, Jesus has said, spiritually nourish all those in authority, rule over the entire church, and spiritually nourish the entire church. You see the wide scope of what Peter's role is supposed to be. And when Peter dies, his successor comes in. And that's going to be the one who assumes the leadership of Peter. Mm -hmm. And that successor is who we have in an unbroken line all the way down to today, sitting in Rome. Who was after Peter? The second pope is Linus. Oh. Yeah, and then it, it just carries over and over and over. Clement and uh, Sixtus and all the, the names keep moving up and up and up. Um, and in fact, two of the early popes are mentioned in the Bible. Linus is mentioned in there and so is Clement. They're both mentioned in the Bible. And they're also in the historical lineage, you see. And it goes all the way up, present day, to John Paul II, Bank XVI, Francis continues, continues, continues. But that's what the passage teaches us about the authority of the Bishop of Rome, you see. Mm -hmm. These are the two foundational passages that the early church and the saints talked about, showing us the authority of Peter and, by, by approximation, the authority of the Bishop of Rome, of the Pope. And uh, the one thing I want to mention, too, that I almost forgot with... Matthew 16, but it, it can even apply here. In the Old Testament, the kingdom of David, okay, the, the Davidic kingdom of the Old Testament, in that kingdom, there was a role called the prime minister in the kingdom of David in the Old Testament that ruled over Israel. The, and the background for that's in Isaiah chapter 22. If you ever want to look it up, it's Isaiah 22. I won't read it now because it's, it's a lot, but that role was there so that whenever the king had to physically leave the kingdom, for any reason, to travel abroad, meet with other uh, people in authority in other countries, or go to a war. If the king ever left, the prime minister assumed all the authority of the king for the kingdom. Because there had to be someone watching over and ruling, right? That's what he had to do. So look at now what happens in the New Testament. Jesus, who is called the son of David, the successor of the Davidic king, the king of kings, he fulfills the role of David. He full, the, new, the New Testament kingdom is what we call the church. So David's kingdom is fulfilled. Now we have the church. We even have a queen mother, that's Mary, who we had one of those also in the Old Testament. 
Okay, so you see all these fulfillments happening. Well, who fulfills the prime minister in the New Testament? It's Peter. And Peter becomes the new prime minister, which means that when Jesus physically is absent, as he is now, we have him sacramentally in the Eucharist, but physically he's not walking around anymore. So he ascended to the Father. So who's overseeing the kingdom in his physical absence? It's the Bishop of Rome. And the way we know that's because when you look at the role of prime minister in the Old Covenant, you know what it talks about? It talks about the key of authority. Or an uh, authoritative absence. Yeah. I'll give you the key to open and shut. And whatever you open will be open. Whatever you shut will be shut. And then what do you see in the New Testament? Keys kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose is loose in heaven. It's showing that Peter fulfills this role. And again, by approximation, his successors. That's, that's the important thing. Um, so we're going to look at one more. And it's in the very next book, which is Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to look at chapter 15. This is actually a long one, so I'm going to try to kind of bullet point it to the main passage. And we'll discuss the context of it. Um, 15? Yeah, Acts chapter 15. The whole chapter? We're not going to read the whole chapter. Um, let me get the specific verse. <laughs> I'm not a reader. Sorry. <laughs> I make Joe paraphrase everything for me. <laughs> okay. This is the first council? Or? This is the very first church council. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can paraphrase it. Um, it's a long one. Well, actually, okay, let's do this then. Um Okay, so someone, if they want volunteer, to read verse 6 down to verse 12. 6 to 12. I can do it. You got it? Okay, go. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter rose and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made choice among you, that by my, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel. I mean, of the gospel, I believe. <laughs> And God, who knows, the heart bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you make trial of God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And then what's the first sentence of verse 12? And all the assembly kept silence. Right and there. All the assembly kept silent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Acts 15 is the very first church council ever in history. Right? We've had many, many councils in, in, in our history since then. But this is the very first one. A council is when the Pope and the bishops get together, all together, in one place. And so we, had, we need to hash out either this heresy or this doctrine, this confusion. And we need to come up with an official decision for the Christians to follow by. In fact, you get a lot of authoritative teachings in history from councils. A lot of our authoritative dogmas and doctrines come from councils. So this is the first one that's ever happened. What's going on in this time historically, you have a group going around. They're called the Judaizers, the Judaizer heresy. It's one of the f most ancient heresies that was tearing apart the church. The Judaizers were going around teaching that, yes, you need to believe in Jesus. Okay, that's true. But you have to follow all the laws of the Old Testament. The Mosaic law. Yeah, the Mosaic Law, which included you need to be circumcised. If you're not, you're not going to heaven. That's what the Judaizers were teaching. They were making Jesus and Moses equal in that sense. So if you're not circumcised, you're going to hell. And believe it or not, at that time, now we look at it nowadays, 2,000 years later, we're like, well, I don't know why that's such a big deal. At that time, Christians were really, really torn on this. They didn't know what they were supposed to do. Because these guys were going through all the cities. And they were saying at the time, well... Yeah, the apostles told us to tell you this. So Christians are getting very confused on what to believe. And they have all these Bible verses they're using to back it up to make sense of it, right? Well, it got to the apostles. The apostles at first weren't really sure what to do with it. See, you see how that's how confusing it was. Like, huh, do they have to get certain... Do, when they say do they have to get circumcised, they're talking about pagan converts. Not Jew, The Jews are already circumcised. But what do you do with the pagan? The okay, The Gentiles who have never been circumcised, different religion, and they want to come into the church. Do they have to be circumcised or do they not have to be? And it's important because you're having thousands and thousands of converts by this time that are pagans. 
And they're coming in thinking, great, we're saved. We're in the true church. But then you have these Judaizers saying, nope, until you do this, you're still going to go to hell. And the apostles are like, what are we going to do? So what happens? They all beat together. Council of Jerusalem. They all meet in Jerusalem. And it's it's all those in authority. It says right there in uh, verse 6, the apostles, and in this translation, the ancients, but the elders. Basically, all those in authority come together to talk about this. What are we going to do? And initially, it says there's a whole bunch of dis discussion. And finally, what happens? Peter stands up. Peter, who's now, by this point, he is the rock of the church. Because this is long after now Jesus has ascended to heaven. This is some years later. He stands up and he has to give the official teaching. Because the apostles don't know what to do about it. And Peter's the one that basically tells the council, he tells everyone there, we declare that you do not need to be circumcised to get to heaven. He says it's by, by the grace of God alone that one gets to heaven. I mean, you know, nothing needs to be added to it. So at this point, he says, circumcision is not required. And that is huge. That was mind-blowing in that day because the Jews had always known for thousands of years you need to get circumcised because Moses said so. You see, now this here comes... Is, this is when they start turning away from the Old Testament and start going to the New. Right? Yeah. Okay. This is the New Testament now being put together. It's being put together. And right. being put in action. And it's confusing yeah. to people. Yeah. But Peter has come up and say, we're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyone can come into this fold that doesn't even be circumcised because it's the grace of God that saves us. Mm -hmm. That's what we call the dogmatic decision. He's putting his foot down like that's it. And that teaching, he says, will stand till the end of time. And to this day, it's never changed in 2,000 years. Once the church makes a dogma, it will never, ever change till the end of time. Right? And, and in Jerusalem, who was the bishop in Jerusalem then? Back then? That was, uh, it was James. James. So and that's that crazy. Yeah, that exactly. In Jerusalem, and James is supposed to be the bishop of Jerusalem. And, yeah, and they know this. And, and Peter's the one that stands up and says, this "Yeah, is what's going to happen?" It's a great point. And then James mm -hmm. submits uh, Peter's yeah. authority. Yeah, like in other words, why doesn't James stand up and say, "Let me give you the dog"? No, he defers to Peter, because mm -hmm. again, they all know Peter's the head guy. Peter makes the decision, and then it says at the end of that, and the whole assembly fell silent. That's why I want you to read that last sentence. Because the decision was made. Peter has declared it. You see what I mean? So that shows you the authority of Peter's role in practice in the New Testament. That's why I wanted to read that one, because to me it's a powerful witness. This one isn't, I think, talked enough, and normally with Protestants, but that's a powerful one to show people. Did Jesus tell everyone, and upon my, this rock, in front of everyone, I'm going to make Peter my first pope? No, just so the apostles. Just the apostles? Oh, just okay. the apostles. And see, that means that the Christians that are converting have to listen to the apostles. Mm -hmm. They have to defer to authority. If they're telling the Christians, Jesus said this to Peter, mm -hmm. we're to obey them. Because that's that's the witness, mm -hmm. you see. But what you don't see in the New Testament is a is a, 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 a blueprint for anarchy. Well, we can all believe whatever we want. We think the Bible says this. Yeah. You don't even see Bibles yet because they don't have any. No, you <laughs> you don't know? Have any well, it's crazy, too, because at that time when, when the apostles and... And the whole, how would you say, like the startup of the church was happening, literally at that time, there was pers uh, persecution mm -hmm. right after. So you would think that, okay, if people are persecuting this group, then it's going to completely diminish and nothing is going to come from it. Mm -hmm. But what happens 2,000 years later, we'll, we're still here after mm -hmm. countless of persecutions that have Good happened, point. even since literally mm -hmm. the beginning. Uh, Peter, he was killed upside down. He was hung. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like it's crazy how many things have happened after that, and it still is true. Yeah, yeah. yeah and Peter was martyred upside down, sixty-seven A.D. Mm -hmm. in Rome. He was killed in Rome. So, but yeah. So hopefully this mostly makes sense because the to recap, then the main things we're trying to show is how do we see this idea of a pope, of a ruler in the Bible, right? Yeah.